2019 has been an exciting year in the field of general urinary oncology, including for prostate cancer, where we've seen where we've made significant progress with several new FDA approvals. Today, I'm joined by a panel of colleagues, all experts in treating prostate cancer, and we're going to highlight clinical data from the ESMO 2019 annual meeting. I'm Dr. Dan George, Professor of Medicine and Surgery at the Duke Cancer Institute of Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Today on this distinguished panel, I'm joined by Dr. Joe O'Sullivan, Clinical Professor in the School of Medicine, Dentistry, and Biomedical Sciences at Queen's University, Belfast, and Dr. Charles Ryan, Professor of Medicine and Medical Oncologist at the University of Minnesota Masonic Cancer Center in, Minnesota, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Christopher Sweeney, a professor of medicine uh, and medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. And finally, Dr. Bertrand Tombol, chairman of the Division of Urology at the Clinique University St. Luc in Brussels, Belgium. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's begin. So let's start first with an update on just hormonal therapy. And Chuck, maybe we can start with you on how do we manage patients with localized prostate cancer beginning on hormonal therapy, say in the context of radiation therapy, are there any things that we need to be mindful of or the consequences of hormonal therapy in that setting? Sure, so uh, it's really important to note that many men with high risk disease uh, are being treated with a combination of radiation and hormonal therapy, and that the duration of hormonal therapy uh, for some of them can be as long as two years. And in fact, some patients will ultimately, of course, end up on lifelong hormonal therapy. Uh, we now know that androgen deprivation therapy is a uh, major metabolic event for a patient with prostate cancer. Uh, we've known for a long time that there are consequences with regards to bone health, with regards to cardiovascular health, uh, the potential for diabetes, and there's an increasing awareness and concern about the long-term cognitive implications of androgen deprivation therapy. So I think, first of all, for those of us clinicians who treat these patients, we need to counsel our patients about this. And it's, it's, it's quite surprising that many patients don't really get a full understanding uh, from their physician uh, or their medical team about what are the consequences of androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, but to, to sort of make a list and sort of think about the things that we would do uh, before starting ADT um, and, and within the early months of ADT, I, would, I generally um, will try to get a sense of First of all, what's the patient's baseline testosterone? Uh, frequently overlooked issue. Uh, secondly is uh, I will do an assessment of bone health. Uh, third, I will uh, check a hemoglobin A1C, make sure that the patient does not already have diabetes. Um, and, uh, and four, I will talk to them about healthier lifestyle, healthy lifestyle, exercise, et cetera. I counsel all of my patients around resistance exercise because that has been proven in randomized controlled trials uh, to reduce the risk of fatigue that's associated with ADT. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a conversation that I have. And then from there, you integrate the, 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 the more long-term monitoring effects over time. When patients come in every three months, um, you know, in general in this setting, their PSAs are going to be down, their cancer is going to be under control. But that's when you begin to have the conversations about how you're doing exercise, how's the diet, uh, let's, let's uh, repeat the bone mineral density after a year, uh, and those types of things. So it's, I consider it a long conversation uh, that's drawn out over the whole course of ADT. It's really interesting. You know, it, it has a lot of implications. A lot of these are the, the, the same kinds of issues their primary care doctor may be covering, but now it's a little bit heightened because of this yeah. change with hormonal therapy, yeah. and it's gonna have maybe a different, a different dynamic to it, and they may not be tuned into that. So right. kind of recognizing that, talking to patients about it.